So what I've found myself doing lately in my videos is not to usually mention or dwell on our current pandemic and our current state of the world. But in this video, I have a short commentary that hopefully is going to be positive. So stay tuned for that. Hi, BookTube. It's Kim at K Becker's Books. And I just have a quick uh, commentary, I guess, or opinion that I wanted to talk to you about. And I'm hoping that some of you who are full-time working parents might get something out of this or be able to commiserate with me. It's been, so I live in New Hampshire in the U.S. and it's been at least a month, if not five weeks, that we've had stay at home and school at home. Uh, which means in my school district that my daughter, who is in seventh grade, is on my laptop all day and she signs in at specific times in specific classes. She has assignments for the, every class. She has some, some classes or videos that she can watch. Others are live Zoom meetings. And so every day is the same from nine to three. She get a, gets a break for lunch. She has a little extra time if classes uh, end early, that type of thing. And I am a full-time working mom and am currently working the majority of time from home with going into the office a couple times a week to get stuff done in person. So honestly, I've been overwhelmed and it's uh, it's been a struggle to balance everything by supervising my child's education and also trying to be a hard-working employee and keeping my job. Fortunately, my the business I work in is an essential business and I would be considered an essential employee. So for the foreseeable future, I will keep my job. And my division is actually has so much work I can barely keep up and my supervisor and I both commiserate all the time, you know, like, I don't know what we're gonna do. I, I can't keep up with this. And that's a good thing. On the flip side, that adds to the stress and tension. And we've, my daughter and I have had many a tear induced day, tears from both of us. And we're simply trying to survive. We're simply trying to balance everything. Um, when the, when the stay at home first started and I was looking on Facebook, there were quite a few memes from homeschoolers about, you know, we've been homeschooling for years and all of a sudden you working parents have to stay home and, you know, ha ha ha, we've been doing it for so long. And, you're complaining about this and we've been keeping our kids home for years and at first there was a lot of laughs it was kind of funny and then I realized it's not so funny anymore because I am not a homeschooling parent normally I did not choose this pandemic situation and I did not choose to have to pull my child out of school I didn't choose to supervise her education while I work full-time and she didn't choose school this way I have a dear friend who moved to the Carolinas a few, several years ago and on Facebook the other day she posted a blog post from a woman who was a previous full-time homeschooler and the article, the short message basically said, what we're doing now is not homeschooling, it's crisis schooling. The minute I read that term, it brought tears to my eyes because I felt vindicated. I felt like somebody knew how I was feeling. On a regular day, I feel like a, an utter failure because I'm overwhelmed and I'm just so anxious about my daughter getting her education and getting the things that she needs from school. We have no social outlets. We have no physical outlets. There's no activities we can do. And those are all the things that uh, most homeschool parents provide. They are deeply involved in getting the right curriculum for their children deeply involved in preparing the learning path for their kids, providing physical outlets and social outlets and activities. Those are what homeschoolers normally do and none of those are available to me. I don't pick the curriculum. I have to supervise what the, the public school provides. There are no activities, there are no social outlets and there are no physical outside outlets. It's, it's felt burdensome and overwhelming and I am fearful for my child because she's afraid. She's afraid of the world as it is now. She's afraid to go out the front door. It's it's almost a chore to try to help her feel better about that. And 
even have her come to the grocery store with me. So it's it's been scary. And when I read this article about crisis schooling, I felt I'm not a wimpy parent. It's it's okay that I feel overwhelmed and I don't feel like I'm doing this well. And it will be okay. This is not normal for anybody. And I felt so much better after that. Oh, it was a relief and a blessing. And for any of you other working parents out there who are now full-time supervisions, supervisors of your child's education, I'm you. I see you. And we're, we're doing this together. And it will be okay. The schools will support us. They will encourage us that this isn't normal for anybody. There will be flexibility. Our child will, our children will not fall into the cracks all over the country and and fail everything. It just won't happen that way. Nobody will let that happen. So I felt so much better after I learned the term crisis schooling and like, yep, that's me. So let's talk about books now. And this is my mid-April wrap up. I'm going to show you the books I read in the order I read them in the first half of April. And the first one is Wondersmith by Jessica Townsend. This is the sequel to Nevermore. So there's only so much I can tell you. I don't want to spoil it for anybody who hasn't read it or whose child hasn't read it. I picked up Nevermore for middle grade March and was um, was really happy about it and wanted to find out what happens in Wondersmith, the book that I already had. So it continues the story of Morgan Crow, who is an 11 year old cursed child. And in the very beginning of Nevermore, we learn that she is rescued from her prophesied, prophesied death at the age of 11 by Jupiter North, who brings her to um, a school for children like her, children who have gifts and talents, but she doesn't know what hers is yet. And Wondersmith um, continues her story of what happens to her at the school with her peers. Um, and that's all I can say. <laughs> I gave Nevermore a three. I also gave Wondersmith a three. Um, it's a middle grade story, but if you have younger middle grade kids who are reading it or who are thinking of reading it, just be aware that, in my opinion, it's much darker and sinister than I was expecting. And I think I said this about Nevermore. There's enough similarities to Harry Potter that it's like, okay. Um, but it was it was enthralling and fantastic and pulled me out of reality. So it was a very fun read and I'm glad I continued with the series. I think the third one is pushed out and will be coming out in the fall. And let me see if I know, it's in the back of the book of what that title is. Some of you are probably already familiar with this. It's called Hollow Pox, The Hunt for Morrigan Crow. And that is what it's going to be. That's the third book in the series. The second book I read in um, April was Jacqueline Woodson's Red at the Bone. This is a library book that I, I've got a pile of library books that I got out before the pandemic and the libraries closed. And I don't know when they're going back to the library, but I'm slowly working through the pile. And this is one of them. This is a story of 16 year old Melody, who is part of a family that is celebrating her coming out at age 16 into adulthood, into society. She's not exactly a debutante, but it's that sort of idea. In the very beginning of the book, they're holding a party, a celebration for that. Um, Melody's mother, Iris, had Melody when she was a teenager and she never got to have the same party and celebration. She never got to experience the last few years of high school and going on to college. Um, you know, at 18 and for her, everything had to be done differently. This is a multi-perspective story that we hear from Melody, we hear from Iris, her mother and her grandparents, and we also hear from Melody's father. Uh, Jacqueline Woodson is a poet and the language is beautiful. I love the story. It's a short enough book so that it took me away from reality, but I was um, easily consumed by the language and its length and I would highly recommend that third book I read in April was my book group book and it's The Girl with the Louding Voice by uh, Abby Dare. Abby Dare is a Nigerian writer and the story is um, about Adani who is a 14 year old Nigerian girl. The interesting thing about the format of the book is Dare writes in broken English from the perspective of Adani who clearly English is not her first language, Nigerian is. And the 
the the language is broken English, but the the more you go into the book and the the longer a dunny develops, her language changes and the story the formatting changes. It's a really interesting way to to play with language and it's a really interesting concept. It tells the story of fourteen year old a dunny who in the very beginning of the book is sold into marriage to a sixty year old man in their village by her father because he needs money to um, have his two sons and him survive. So she is sold to a 60 year old taxi business owner who already has two wives. All a Dunny wanted was an education. She wanted to go to school. Her mother is, is her, her mother died recently. And the one thing her mother told her while she was alive was that she would get her sent to school. She made her husband promise he would not sell a Dunny into marriage and he would send her to school. He breaks his promise and sells her off. Um, it tells the story of her life with this as the third wife. It tells the story of developments that happen after that and going towards her future. We find out what it means to be a girl with a louding voice. And we find out if a dunny ever reaches her dream of getting an education. I gave the book a three. It's a good book and I enjoyed reading it. But to me, it's very obviously a first novel, which is fine. I'm really looking forward to reading Dare's next book. But there were quite a few things that were peppered through the story that Dare, I don't believe, wrapped up well enough. There was a lot. She addressed a lot in the book. There were a lot of characters that tied together, but it, the resolutions kind of left me hanging. So I, I did enjoy the book. And I would recommend it, especially as a first novel. And I'm, I am looking forward to what she writes next. The third, third, fourth, fourth book I read in April, I read on my Kindle and it is Funny You Don't Look Autistic by Michael McCreary. Um, I have a family member with autism and diagnosed with high functioning autism. The experts, so-called experts, don't use the term Asperger's anymore. So they use high functioning autism. If you have Asperger's, you have autism. It could be a good thing as far as diagnostic services go, but it is what it is. And so I found this book on Amazon on my Kindle and McCreary has high functioning autism. He is one of three brothers. His younger brother has autism that is not high functioning. So he is nonverbal and um, struggles to communicate. Um, Michael McCreary is becomes a stand-up comic and he starts off in his school as a student being interested in music and theater and realizes along the way he loves comedy he talks about his experiences in school with bullying with friendships and social aspects one of the most transparent things he does is he talks about all the things that are in his head at any given time and that was really fun for me and educational for me in understanding more about how my my person thinks and how they process he was very open and transparent about that he's a he's a really good writer and he expresses himself well to the point where i i understand what he's trying to tell me and i felt heartbroken for him reading his experiences through school and what he had to deal with with other kids and um it was really fun towards the end of the book to see his rise in comedy and his love and discovery of that part of himself. He talks about his family. He talks about gaining more independence, which he can do. So it was a really fun book to read. And I was, I learned a lot from him. Um, and he's not a, he's not an old guy. He's a young guy. Um, but I actually wanted to go on YouTube and look up some of his comedy routines and, and have fun with that. So I, was def I would definitely recommend that. And the last book I read in the first half of April is Jeanette Winterson's Frankenstein. Uh, this was one of the weirdest books I've ever read. Um, very interesting. Wanted to keep reading, but I don't think Jeanette Winterson is for me. I really loved the concept. It is a dual timeline retelling of the story of Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. She writes from the 1800s between Mary Shelley um, and her husband, the poet, talking about 
the assumption she's retelling their life, how Mary Shelley came upon writing the book Frankenstein, and then she jumps to a modern timeline with a kind of a mad scientist, Victor Stein, and a doctor named Rye Shelley. There's a lot of commentary in the book about artificial intelligence and what does it mean to be alive and what does it mean to, um, what are, who are living beings? Can we include robots and artificial intelligence in living sentient beings? Can a being choose to have a life similar to what a human would have upon birth? What will develop in artificial intelligence in the future? Some of my issues with this book is there; it's very lectury. I was reading a lot about uh, philosophical discussions on artificial artificial intelligence and robotics, um, sex bots, robots created specifically for sexual activity. Um, there was a lot about religion and the soul. A lot of retelling about the story Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's life, um, Dr. Frankenstein in the book. It went kind of all over the place. And I believe that's Jeanette Winterson's style. She has said in her memoir, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute, that she's not a writer who writes a linear narrative. She jumps all over the place and gives you small pieces of information and small pieces of, of story. And she, that's how she operates. I don't think that works well for me. And I was interested in the book. I did finish it. I gave it a three. Um, many, many other people I have seen who have loved this book. I pick it up and try it. Uh, I just didn't love it. So that was that. Those are the books I finished so far. I think that's five in the beginning of April. There were two DNFs. And ironically, one of them was... Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal by Jeanette Winterson. Again, this is in my stack of library books that I'm getting through. This is Jeanette Winterson's memoir, which matches up with Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, which is her first novel back when she was 25 years old. I'm not sure why this came so much later. This is Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit I read last year, and I really enjoyed that book, which was a fictionalized account of Jeanette's life. This is the memoir. And... I did not enjoy this as much as her novel, and I DNF'd this book for many of the same reasons I also ta I already talked about. The the chunks in in narrative and nothing is it. She jumps all over the place. She writes a little portion and then jumps to something else. It did feel a little luxury to me. I was reading a lot of backstory and history and information. I just didn't enjoy it that much, and it wasn't for me. You all, however, might like it. The other one I DNF'd is Ruth Ware's The Death of Mrs. Westaway, and this was the third Ruth Ware I attempted. I finished two others, The Woman in Cabin 10, which I didn't like, and The Turn of the Screw, which I did like, I read last year. So I picked this one up. I have a few other Ruth Ware books, which I am now giving away, donating. This is the story of a young woman who is a tarot card reader, a psychic. Um, she inherited this, this work from her mother, who passed away at the beginning of the book or who she talks about as as she had passed away this gets very repetitive and I only read the first 60 or so pages but Ruth Ware gets very repetitive in the story talks about the main character over and over and over again tarot cards tarot cards readings what this means what that means she has no money the protagonist receives a letter telling her that she is the heir to the estate of Mrs. Westaway there is a, it's a case of mistaken identity because she's not part of that family. I just wanted to get to that storyline and find out what's happening, but it was repetitive story of how broke she is, her tarot card readings, a sinister element that keeps following her, and I got bored, so I, I DNF'd that one. And I don't think Ruth Ware is for me going forward, so I'm going to donate the rest of the books I have of hers. Very quickly, what am I currently reading? I am currently reading and loving The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller, who wrote Circe, which I read last year. I am almost done with this. I think I have, oh, 70 pages to go, and I'll finish this today. This is a retelling of the Iliad and the relationship between Achilles and Patroclus, his companion. I love this book, and I think I like this even more than Circe, and this was Madeline Miller's first novel. 
Uh, it doesn't read like a first novel in my opinion and I love her writing. I love the retelling of the story. It's, it's fast paced. The writing is beautiful. I love the the assumptions that she makes based on the Iliad of the nature of their relationship and her descriptions. Um, I love that book. So I'll, I'll tell you more about it. The end of April. And the other book I'm currently reading is for Aussie April, come to find out. Uh, a Loving Faithful Animal by Josephine Rowe, who is an Australian writer. This is a very short novel. The story very quickly is, it is New Year's Eve 1990 in a small town in southeast Australia. Rue's father, Jack, one of thousands of Australians once conscripted to serve in the Vietnam War, has disappeared. The t this time, Rue thinks he might be gone for good. As rumors spread of a huge black cat stalking the landscape beyond their door, the rest of the family is barely holding on. Rue's sister, Lainey, is throwing herself into sex, drugs, and dangerous company. Their mother, Evelyn, is escaping into memories of a more vibrant youth. And meanwhile, there is Les, Jack's inscrutable brother, who seems to move through their lives like a ghost, earning both trust and suspicion. I've read um, the first few pages. So far, I absolutely love the writing. It looks like a very good story, and I'm looking forward to continuing with this. I might be able to even finish it or get... It's a really short book. It's 164 pages. And I think I might be able to read this today and get my Goodreads book count up really high very quickly. Not that I care about that, but yes, I do. Um, so that's it for my mid-April review. That's what I've read so far in April. Write a comment below if you've read any of the books or what you think of the books. If you're, you know, if you didn't like the same books that I didn't like or what you think of my DNFs, um, write any comment below. I hope you're doing well. Thank you so much for coming and watching my video, and I will see you soon. Bye!